thank you. Do we have one more? We have one short one, one verse. Anybody? Okay, 575, just the first verse. <laughs> this is a good one. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Okay, sing out loud. continue to worship God with great adoration. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> it's a lot of energy for this time of the morning. It's great to be with you. I'm going to be doing my best Christian impersonation this morning <laughs> to help lead us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Danny, and every now and again, Kristen has me come and be a part of, of uh, the worship here. And so what we want to do this morning, and for those of you who know me a little, you know I'm always going to do this. There's just no way of getting away with it. What we're going to do is just take a moment just to still our hearts, just to get quiet, just to say, Lord, I'm here. Um, I, you know, I always say this, our bodies can be here, our hearts can be elsewhere completely. And so we want to take a moment just to say to the Lord, I bring my heart here. I bring my heart to this moment, to this place now. So just take a moment to do that uh, in silence. Then we'll pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on into the songs. So, Lord, we're here, and I ask you to help us to open our hearts to you so that we can be present to your word, we can be present to your voice, be present to your will. Help us to be here. And by your grace, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have hearts that can be open to receive you. No matter what our circumstances and no matter what might be happening in our lives, help us to lift our eyes up to you this morning. So I ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's an, an adaptation of the prayer of St. Patrick. And you can see the spots where we, you respond. So let's begin. We arise today with God's strength to pile us. God's might to uphold us. God's wisdom to guide us. God's eye to look before us. God's ear to hear us. God's word to speak for us. God's hand to guide us. God's way to lie before us. God's shield to protect us. We arise today. Through the strength of heaven. We arise today. Through a mighty strength. The blessing of the Trinity. Between every song this morning, we're going to have a little, a little refrain, a little spoken refrain. We'll, we'll say these words together. Uh, so we'll say it now, and then after every song, you'll see it come up, and we'll, and we'll pray this little, uh, this little uh, refrain together all the way through our worship time this morning. So let's begin with it. My eyes are fixed on you, O my strength, for you, O God, are my stronghold. Merciful God comes to me.
My eyes are fixed on you, O oh my strength. For you, O oh God, are my stronghold. My merciful God comes to meet me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Savior's love through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and strong in the Savior's love. in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne faultless to stand before the throne Christ alone cornerstone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Fixed on you, O oh my strength, 
For you, O oh God, are my stronghold. My merciful God comes to me. stronghold. My merciful God comes to meet me. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is a great opportunity 
to express the peace that we feel, that we know that is in our hearts as a result of the love that Jesus Christ has for us, to express it one to another in community. And so we do that now in Jesus' name. Let's pass the peace of Christ to one another. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. So we're going to talk about, well, actually, I have some questions for you first. What are some of the kinds of things that you enjoy doing? So do, what? Playing soccer. Same. Playing soccer. OK. Anyone else like to play soccer? Wow, lots of hands. What else do you like to do? That's it. <laughs> Play basketball. Play basketball. Play Legos with my sister. Wow, that sounds great. Okay. So I have a question about this. This is a good um, supply of different interests. What I want to know is, is it always easy to build with Legos? Is it always easy to play with soccer? Or do you ever get discouraged? What do you think? So being discouraged in soccer might mean, wow, my team's down one point, and I can't get free to get that, that goal in there. What would you do? Do you have an idea? Anyone have an idea? Would you just say, that's it? OK, well, I want to read you a passage from the scripture that um, Pastor Ian is going to preach today. I don't know my phone, and now my phone is requiring me to, okay. Eat when youths grow tired, that's you guys, and weary, and the young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, and they will soar on the wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow tired. So let's just unpack that a little bit. That means that if you're playing soccer and you only have five minutes left, your legs might be tired of running and you just can't reach that final goal. If you're playing basketball, it might mean the same thing. Or, wow, why are my shots always off? But if we look to the Lord, he meets us where we are. And he surrounds us with his love and he helps us gather more strength so that we can complete what we want to do. So one of the challenges, look at the Lord, look to the Lord when things get a little tough. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. We thank you for your great love for all of us. Help us to remember that when times get difficult, you are always there for us. 
And all we need to do is lift our eyes and look towards you for our strength. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may gather a package so they're staying in church today. Well, it's great to see you all this morning. Mary and Kurt and Kristen and others have been in balmy <laughs> Grand Rapids, Michigan, which was, I believe, 10 degrees this morning at 7 a.m. I checked on my phone, so I think some of them are flying back, but they've been at a conference uh, for the last number of days. It's an annual conference that they do, and um, so it's my privilege to come and speak to you this morning. My name is Ian Hamilton. I'm the uh, parish associate pastor here at Trinity, and it's uh, a gift and a privilege to be with you this morning. We're going to be reading from uh, the last few verses of the chapter 40 of Isaiah. So you can follow along on the screens if you want to follow along in your Bible. Uh, please do so. The title of what I'm going to talk about this morning is As We Wait, Isaiah 40 beginning in verse 25, reads like this. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength and mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Which, by the way, is just an incredible phrase of tenderness, God's tender love for you and I. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the gift of God's word to us this morning. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite you to pray with me and then I'll begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, into your hands we commit this word to you, from you to us this morning. And ask that we would hear afresh from you. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear that which you would want us to know about you. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you were to ask me my favorite food to eat or my favorite movie to watch or favorite book to read or a favorite destination, location, and so on, I would not be able to do it. My wife, Kim, can attest that I am not one of those people who can easily name their favorite things. I could give you two or three or four options of what could be my favorites, but naming my one single favorite thing is hard for me to do. Some of you here this morning, now you can do that. You are one of those people, those favorite naming people, <laughs> but I'm not wired that way. However, when it comes to listing the things I really like or love to do, I definitely have a short list that I can name. So under the heading of getting to know me a little bit better, I offer some of that list to you this morning. For example, I love to ski down mountains. I used to love to ski down really fast, <laughs> but now I just love to ski them whenever I can. 
I love long walks in the forest with my wife, Kim. I love riding in horses in Wyoming with her in the summer. And I love fly fishing with my brother. Also on this short list is the love affair that I have with running. I love to run. And more specifically, I love, to lo- I love to run on trails. There's so much to see and experience in nature when you run trails. The tracks of animals below my feet, the screech of a hawk in flight above. Occasionally, there's the arching of trees on both sides of the trail, which gives this feel like you're running into and through a hollow, much like an adventure in the Lord of the Rings. I love the views and the vistas and the aromas that come from life on the trail. Ultimately, though, I run because it's good for me, and it makes me feel alive, strong, healthy, full. There really is such a thing as a runner's high, and yes, that high can be very, very addicting. But the greatest gift for me on the running trail is that it's where I meet and commune with God. I think a lot about him while I run. I pray often to him while I run. I work through sermon ideas and theological questions I have. I rehearse passages of scripture that have captured my heart. And some time ago, I came to realize that the running trail is a great metaphor to describe the Christian life, and it goes like this. There are some days in my life as a follower of Christ where I spring out of bed early in the morning to eagerly dive into the scriptures. On those days, I anticipate with great joy an encounter with God, much like the joy I experience when I run on the trail. I can't wait to meet him in the depth of my soul. I can't wait to hear his voice. I can't wait to see his beauty and to give him praise just for being who he is. We've sung about it this morning. Loving and kind and merciful, everlasting, holy, creator, God. And yet on other days, being a Christ follower can be a bit of a struggle, just like how running on the trail can be difficult too. For example, there are days when I run that I really don't feel like running. (laughs) On those days, my legs feel heavy, like I'm running in soaking wet hiking boots. On those days, I labor like I'm carrying a backpack full of rocks. On those days, I strain at my running, and it's all I can do to persevere to get home. In the same way, there are days when I pray or read the scriptures that I'm really not praying or reading the scriptures. I'm just going through the motions. I find that my heart is distracted by my to-do list for the day. My mind is thinking about other things, though it may appear that I'm reading the Gospels or praying the Psalms. On other days, instead of thinking about what my to-do list might be, I find myself distracted by by all the hard and sad and worrisome news out there, of which there is no shortage. Sickness and health issues abound, don't they? There are fractured relationships at work in the family. Unanswered prayers of all sizes and shapes. Rejection in our schools or places of employment. Perhaps rejection from our loved ones at home. On those days, similar to the days that I don't feel like running, my heart is heavy. Fear and doubt settle into my bones and I find myself weary in my waiting for God. On those days, the weariness in my soul feels like I'm walking around in soaking wet hiking boots with a backpack full of rocks, and it's all I can do to press on and persevere as I head towards home. The Christian life, like life on the running trail, is hard at times, and it's lonely at times. How about you? What do you feel in your heart these days as you wait for God to show up and break through in your circumstances? What do you feel in your heart as you bear your soul to the one who promised hope and healing in his abiding presence, only to feel as though God's train has left the station with you still on the platform, passed over and forgotten? We've all been there. Perhaps some of us are there this morning. Weariness of soul may not describe you this morning, but it certainly does describe someone that you know. 
And so all of us are invited to tune in nonetheless. The good news is that we have these verses in Isaiah 40. For they are the perfect tonic to center us, to sharpen our focus on God and to bring us back to life. They are consoling. They are uplifting. And I encourage you to read them this week. Read them often. They are the light we need to cut through the darkness, leading us onward into the depth of God's heart. And that is the goal of the Christian life. And so from our passage this morning, there are a few observations that I would like to make before concluding with a couple of takeaway thoughts, if you will. So here we go. Buckle in. You ready? Everybody's with me? First of all, there is the context to the chapter. Isaiah 40 can be blocked into two distinct halves, verses 1 through 11, verses 12 through the end of the chapter. It is in this latter block, beginning in verse 12, that I want you to imagine with me a courtroom scene. Think Perry Mason for a moment, or a few good men, or Philadelphia, or the people versus OJ. I think that pretty much covers all of our age ranges here. The setting in Isaiah 40 is like a courtroom drama where God as judge is presiding over his court. Isaiah is God's chosen barrister, his attorney, if you will. But what I want you to notice is who is on the witness stand. First and foremost, it's the nation of Israel. After all, they were the original audience that Isaiah was writing to you. But today, this morning, it's also you and I and the communities in which we live, we are all on the witness stand. It is as if people from all time are in the box, on the stand, listening in on the speech that Isaiah gives. It's a scene from a courtroom drama, and it's very powerful, and it's very dramatic. The second observation I would like to make is that no less than 21 times in the final half of the chapter... Do we hear a question posed by Isaiah to those who are on the witness stand? 21 questions reverberate and bounce off the walls of the courtroom chamber. Remember, the nation of Israel is on the witness stand. They are the original audience to this prophecy. They knew God. They celebrated God. They worshiped God. But in their weariness, in their being overwhelmed by the circumstances of life, They forgot God. They needed to be reminded to invite God back into the fold of their lives. And we are no different than they. We, like the nation of Israel, need to pay attention to the questions that the prophet Isaiah asks. For example, one of the most penetrating questions comes from God himself, who says very pointedly in verse 25, to whom then will you liken me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? The answer to which, after a long pause, comes from Isaiah himself, who reminds us by saying, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these, he who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength and mighty in power, not one is missing. That's who. Who is my equal, asks the Holy One. More on that verse in a moment. A third observation as you read this chapter is that you will notice that the answers to these questions are never given. Rather, the answers are implied. The answers are often left hanging over us, the listener in the witness stand, to drive home the point that Isaiah is making, which is this, that God is sovereign over all. That God is intimately involved in and with his creation. That God knows and tenderly cares for you. An image found earlier in the chapter. That God will always, always, always be faithful to you. To use a common phrase that we hear these days, he's got this. God is sovereign over all. And though we may be weary and feel like fainting because life is coming at us hard and fast and at times with deceptive confusion, he does not faint or grow weary ever, ever. 
Let that reverberate off the inner chamber of your heart this morning. Therefore, verse 31 says that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Good news for us who are on this intimate journey with God, don't you think? The fourth and final observation is about the word wait as it is proposed and framed here in verse 31. The word Isaiah uses for wait is pronounced kawa, which is kind of a cool-sounding word. Simply means to hope for, to look forward to with eager expectation and endurance. And endurance. The lesson here is that the fulfillment of hope always lies in the future. But in the end, the target we strive to hit, the goal we seek to grasp, the object of our hope is God, and there is no other. And that principle is the underlying theme to the whole chapter of Isaiah 40. As one of my professors said, this hope hinges on God, who is the power of the future. He is the God who raised the crucified Christ from the dead and has shown himself time and time and time again to be faithful to his promises. Therefore, we need kawa in our lives. We need hope that is grounded in God. Do you know why? Because in our weariness and exhaustion, we lose our ability to hear God. And we lose our understanding of how God is actively at work in us and in our world. I think the psalmist sums it up quite well. Psalm 39, 7. And now, O Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Some of you know the challenge this type of waiting on God can be. One couple I know has been trying to have kids for four years or so. <clears throat> You know, I practice this like crazy, <laughs> and not one tear is shed. But though all the tests come back stating that their systems are normal, they're not able to conceive, <clears throat> and so they wait. A young boy who attends our Trinity Preschool has been suffering with a rare blood disease. And I can only imagine his parents are fit to be tied and worried sick. And so we pray and they wait. And so the question on the table is this. How do we faithfully wait for God to show up and break through in our lives or in our church? Or as I learned this past week in my studies, perhaps the question we should be asking is what kind of people do we need to be for this story, this message of Isaiah 40 to make sense? They're both great questions. I propose the answer to these questions lies in verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Trinity, we need to be the kind of people who naturally and often lift up our eyes on high and see. We need to be the kind of people who instinctively look for God and see that he is holy and creator and everlasting and tender and loving. But this seeing only comes about with practice it's not natural for us to submit and be humble and wait, is it? The other day, Kim and I were weaving our way in and around Menlo Park, or I should say I was weaving and Kim was along for the ride. 
but I was trying to avoid the clogged up streets all around us, and I came to a stop sign, and I looked quickly to my left, and all was clear. And in a split second, I looked right, assessed the speed of the car coming in my direction, and then quickly pulled out in front of that oncoming car. As I gunned the accelerator to create this false sense of appropriate distance between me and the car behind me as though I had done nothing wrong, Kim gently reminded me and said to me, at times, you are an impatient driver. <laughs> now, if you know Kim at all, you know when I say that there wasn't an ounce of meanness in her voice. Just truth. Because waiting is hard for impatient people. But waiting is a gift that God gives us to form us and shape us into the people he so desires for us to be. The truth to order our lives, the truth to order our lives by is admitting to God and saying to God, you got this. <laughs> I don't. Lifting up your eyes on high is about submission to his rule and reign in our lives. And it's not natural for us but it is oh so nourishing for our souls. And I love this about God and his word to us. He gives us the, the tasting notes, if you will, the movements within our spirit by his spirit of what you can expect when you practice waiting. For example, you will find that your strength is renewed and replenished. You will experience the breath and the wind and the release of God in your life like the effortless movement of an eagle soaring high above. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. But in order to experience these tasting notes, this shift in your reality, you need to come and learn and listen from God as he reveals himself to us through his word and in his created world which is all around us. Perhaps, and of course we don't know for sure, but perhaps Jesus had Isaiah 40 in mind when he said in Matthew 11, Come all those with weary and heavy laden hearts. Come to me, my children, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. So here's our takeaway, and with this I close. As we faithfully wait for the coming of the Lord, as we reflect on the kind of people that we need to be for this story of placing our hope in God to make sense to us, I invite you into this practice of lifting up your eyes on high to see God. In other words, when you encounter God in the scriptures, say to him, I see you here. Acknowledge his presence within the written word and then simply thank him that you have found him. What I know you will find this week and beyond is the temptation to be overwhelmed and wearied by your circumstances. There will be something of this, I am sure. But the answer every time to combat this temptation is to come and draw near to God by lifting up your eyes and look for God as he reveals himself to you. Isaiah 40 is a chapter that reveals to us that God is holy and wild and sovereign and magnificent and that he is indeed the king of kings. But as you read Isaiah 40, do you get the point that I want you to read it this week? As you read Isaiah 40 this week, you will also see him as tender and loving and caring and that good, great shepherd of your soul. When you name and acknowledge God as you see him, as I just did here, you will find your strength returning you will find your spirit rejuvenated, lifted up, mounted up like the wings of an eagle, like an eagle. <laughs> like my running on the trail, time spent alone with God in the quiet of your heart will make you feel alive, healthy, strong, full. But we need to encourage each other to lift up our eyes on high. And when we do, trust me, we will see. Let's pray together. Thank you, O Holy Father, 
for walking alongside us by your Spirit. Help us to trust that you've got this, that you are indeed the sovereign one, the Lord of, the, of heaven and earth. May we see you this week as we practice lifting up our eyes on high to see you as the one who loves us and cares for us and desires to renew us with strength and hope and courage in the midst of our circumstances. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a moment having heard this word, just to actually practice lifting up our eyes. Rather than wait for another moment, we'll practice now. And the way we'll do this is to um, speak these words from the scriptures. Now, I know that sometimes when our heart is broken or our heart is weary, the words sometimes feel a little empty, a little hollow, but I want to invite you to open your heart to the Lord and say the words anyway. Speak them out. Sometimes what happens with the words is they lay on top of your heart and then your heart opens and they fall in. So we speak this to our soul. Let's say this together. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in my word, I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. And scars and struggles on the way. But with joy our hearts can say. Yes, our hearts can say Never once did we ever walk alone Never once did you leave us on our own You are faithful, God You are faithful You are faithful say this. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say 
as our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Say this. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And scars and struggles on the way. But with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own, you are faithful. Trinity Supported Missions, Mission Aviation Fellowship. Thank you. Good morning, Trinity Presbyterian Church. John Woodbury here, and I serve with Mission Aviation Fellowship as a Global Disaster Response Manager. I just wanted to thank you so much for your prayers and financial support that enable us to serve with MAF. MAF's vision is to share the love of Jesus Christ through aviation and technology so that Isolated people can be physically and spiritually transformed. I hope you enjoy this short video, which will give you a little bit of a feel of the work you have been a part of. Thank you. When disaster strikes, we need to move fast. It's those early moments following a disaster that are the most crucial. Whether it's a war or famine, a medical epidemic or a natural disaster, each decision made needs to support a rapid, impactful and efficient response. If we do this, we save lives. Throughout the past 70 years, we've been able to play this role in some of the world's most devastating disasters. We can do this by using the tools and gifts that God has placed at our disposal, reaching isolated communities in their time of need. When disaster brings hunger, we can bring in food. When disaster brings vulnerability, we can bring in shelter. When disaster brings sickness, we can bring in medicine. When disaster brings despair, together we can bring hope.
I hope you enjoyed the video. If you would like to know more about the ministry of MAF or how you can pray or support us personally, please send me an email. Thank you very much. I'm Sarah Haller. I'm not supposed to touch the microphone. <laughs> it's supposed to adjust to me. There you go. Thanks, guys. I'm Sarah Haller. Thank you, Linda. This is Julie Pope, and this is Kathy Lair, and together the three of us are sometimes considered the GGA or Great Getaway Triad. Sometimes we're called something else that has to do with threes, but <laughs> I'd like to know how many of you have ever been to Great Getaway? Okay, maybe I should ask how many have not been to Great Getaway yet? Okay, that's great, okay. So for those who have been to Great Getaway, how much do you love GGA, right? Isn't it fun? Okay, well, for those who are not aware, Great Getaway is Trinity's annual all church retreat where we gather to enjoy nature, sing, play, worship, and do no chores for an entire weekend. We're here this morning to let you know several things about Great Getaway for 2019. First, we're excited to tell you that Great Getaway 2019 is Friday evening, May 3rd through Sunday morning, May 5th, at Redwood Glen in the beautiful Santa Cruz Mountains. If you'd like to know how to volunteer in any capacity, Please see Julie or me. Um, second, because of the success of our Pay It Forward offerings in the past, even though Redwood Glen had to increase their costs this year, Trinity is able to offer the same pricing we had last year. And the year before. And the year before. <laughs> and also offer scholarship, scholarships. So if you'd like scholarship info, please see Kathy. Um, third, we're thrilled to announce that the theme for this year is coming alongside experiencing God's spirit from the inside out. And our guest speaker is none other than our very own Ian Hamilton. Yay! So mark your calendars for the first weekend in May and come unplug and unwind with your Trinity family. Signups begin in two weeks which is February 10th in Fellowship Hall. We're going, are you? <laughs> Thank you. I invite the ushers to please come down. Now is a great time to exercise the spiritual gift of giving. We just saw John in the ministry that he's about at the with MAF, and there's lots of ministries going on that are local and global, as well as what's happening within this community. So give as the Lord has given to us. When the plate comes by you, sing along with us. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God, for oh, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me, yes, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. 
you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh God for your Gracious Lord, we know that the story is wonderfully complete in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, yet you know how tired and weary we can be in the current unfolding story of our lives. We face pressures at school or work or difficulties with family or relationships. We can struggle in the face of limitations in health or with loneliness or with cycles of despair. In those areas of our life where we are tired and feeling like giving up, we ask you to come alongside us and ease our burden, for you are strong and see our need. You are not uncaring or distant, but an ever-present hope in our present condition. We ask that you provide perspective and comfort and rest for the exhausted. Provide your living water to others we may meet who have stopped on the road of life who are thirsty and need your spirit to be refreshed, whether they are in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or uh, the upcoming Mexico trip. Replace the lies of doubt and discouragement that have settled into our thinking processes. We wait for you to arrive in our collective story, our individual circumstance, with the hopeful expectation that we will not be put to shame because of our trust in you, but that on the other side of difficulty, we will see that you were loving us all along. God of creation, we come to you today in this moment at Trinity Presbyterian Church on the corner of Alameda de las Polgas in Britain with our own unique situation. In this brief moment of silence, Lord, Speak to us about areas of weariness where there is a need for a word from you. God, we have heard through the sermon today how you are able to overcome the weariness we encounter in our journey of faith. I pray that the message Ian had for us take root in our minds and hearts to the point that we feel emboldened to place our full trust in you so that we and others may run and not grow weary. Amen. So we're going to end up song just by referring once again just to that song that we, we sang earlier i'll set it up like this scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say never once did we ever walk alone carried by your constant grace held within your perfect peace never once no, we never walk alone. Why don't you stand and sing this with me? Never once. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave 
us on our home. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Every step we are breathing in your grace. Evermore we'll be breathing out your praise. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful, God. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are Just two quick announcements, actually one announcement. At the end of the service, and as this day progresses, and I'm not sure how long it's for, Drew, you'll know, but we are to bring our things because... Till three, thank you. You knew where I was going. Three o'clock till three today. Bring your things that have been crowding up in your, in your living room and in your house because we have the great, great garage sale, thank you, that's coming this coming weekend. So... You need to start bringing those things over till 3 o'clock today and then the, throughout the rest of the week until what, about 9? Nine? 9 to 9. Perfect, okay. Um, Dave, I think you have a slide for us because we want to welcome a young lad. We don't have a, so oh, we don't have a slide. Okay, well, let me just tell you that if there was a slide, you would see a little baby boy by the name of Lawrence Carter Burns who was born to Dustin and Kayla this past Monday at 7 pounds, 11 ounces. Lawrence Carter Burns. So just imagine what he looks like at six days old now. <clears throat> Lift up your eyes on high and see the Lord of glory, who is our King, who loves us and cares for us intimately. And as you do, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Remember